So it's because of men's use of violence that women are facing this terrible choice between staying in abuse or poverty and homelessness. Yet the societal message is still so often, why doesn't she just leave, which places the responsibility with her. So I'm wondering what the panellists think could be done to shift the responsibility from the user of violence, uh, sorry, to the user of violence, and how we could change the normalised narrative that expects women to physically leave the home when they're in an abusive relationship. Marty, thank you. Um, and Summers, the, the massive report that you've just published, in it you talk about the irresponsibility, that's the phrase you use, the irresponsibility of a society that encourages women to leave violent relationships but doesn't provide them with adequate and safe alternatives. That's pretty much where Marty's going this evening, isn't it? Yes. Um, I mean, what I try to say in the report and what motivate, motivated me to do this work and to do this research was the fact that I felt that the conversation about domestic violence in this country wasn't going anywhere. That, I mean, Rosie Batty did an incredible job in raising awareness of it. I think the issue is very much on the political agenda. We're very aware of it, but nothing's changed. And I felt one of the reasons that nothing has changed is that the data hasn't changed. We don't know enough about what's happening. Mm. And that, that is what motivated me to go and do this very in-depth research from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and get, get never-before-published data about just how bad it really is. Now, one, the, the, the data is mainly about women as victims, uh, and, and what, that's what I looked at. There are certainly uh, programs that are, um, I think, somewhat controversial. Uh, as to whether or not the woman should stay at home, stay in the home and the man be made, be made to leave. Um, and that certainly sounds much fairer, uh, but it's often not safer mm. and it's not practical. Uh, so I don't think uh, that, that is the way... That is not the solution. It's certainly not the immediate solution. I mean, the immediate solution facing so many women... I mean, that, the numbers that I have, uh, which are based on the ABS numbers, that there are 275,000 women in Australia in 2016, the number probably about the same now, who live with a violent partner. 275,000, that's a lot of women. 90,000 yeah. of them wanted to leave but couldn't, many of them because of lack of money. So the, the ones who did leave uh, and, and, and are now single mothers as a result, 185,700 of them who experienced violence, they were all married at the time they were experiencing the violence, mm. but they left and became single mothers and 50% of them are now living in... Poverty. Let me just spool through a couple of the, the, the key findings, and it, it's a, a massive and, and weighty report, but they include the high number of women who experience violence and are now single mothers with kids under 18, the high number of women who wanted to leave but couldn't because they couldn't afford to, the high number of women who left but came back because they couldn't survive financially, and the women who were not in poverty before they left but were after, after leaving. Mm. So it's, it's, it's astonishing and it's painting a picture and a connection, a nexus now, between domestic violence and poverty that we haven't had before. And I think that's, that's probably the main takeaway that I hope people get from this report, and that is that, you know, for a long time it's been... The, the, the presupposition has been that violence is, is the cause of domestic violence yeah. and only poor people suffer it. And it happens in, you know, poor suburbs and everybody else, it's, you know, if it happens, it's just an occasional thing. That is not the case. I mean, we don't know the uh, incidents via postcode, unfortunately, but I think if we did know, we'd be very shocked at, at how high the incidence is, regardless of where people live. Um, what we do, do know is that... Um, Leaving a relationship um, of whatever kind. I mean, some of the people that were looked at in uh, an associated work that was done on Hilda statistics, which are uh, longitudinal ones and give us uh, inf information over time, some of the men involved in that, the, that these women left were earning up to $600,000 a year. And uh, there's those women's income, household incomes, declined by as much as 45% after they left. Let me get to the rest of the panel on this and uh, Marty's question in particular about expecting women to leave. Anne Ali, I know you've had a particular and personal experience of this and we're happy to hear whatever you're prepared to share this evening. But what are your reflections on that question? Um, I think, Marty, to um, respond to your question, I think we need to be changing that question. It shouldn't, we shouldn't be asking, why don't women leave? We should be asking, why do women have to leave? And then we should be asking, what happens? when they leave, 
Why do they have to leave? And then what happens when they leave? If we start asking those two questions as a society, the answers that we'll get are very different to the answer of why don't women leave, I think. Um, let me tell you, it is the hardest thing I ever did in my life mm. to leave. And I've done some pretty hard stuff, right? The most difficult thing I ever had to do in my life was leave. Um, because I had two children. I had two boys. I didn't want them to be without a father. And there's all this society expectation of, you know, children being raised, boys being raised with their father. I knew that I was leaving to lead a life of poverty. And the humiliation of walking into that Centrelink office mm. and saying, I don't know how I'm going to feed my kids or myself, still sits with me 30 years on. Mm. After everything that I went through, the hardest thing was to leave. <clears throat> That's why women don't leave. Let me turn to Veronica Gorey on this. Veronica? Uh, I just want to talk about the report, go back to the report. And um, so I did read your report, all 101 pages, I believe. Um, and what I, what I took from that was the exclusion of Aboriginal women. There's no data in relation to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander women. Um, and also I found that your report was quite um, gender biased. Like we're talking about um, women being victims right now, but men are also victims as well. And other people from the LGBTQI plus community, however they identify themselves, are victims as well. And your report only, um, the victim is only the woman. I found that upsetting as well. Um, and with, as an Aboriginal person, like it's about sorry. No, oh, just just wait one second. I'll get, I'll get a I response. Just from... asking Virginia if I could respond. To I'll that get a response from Anne. Yeah, well, I haven't yeah. finished it, Anne. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so with Aboriginal people, we don't. I wish poverty was the only thing we had to worry about mm -hmm. when we're dealing with domestic violence. It's not the violence that is um, um, that we suffer at the hands of police when police turn up at um, a domestic violence incident is a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. Aboriginal women are deemed to be um, the perpetrators and are locked up and our children are taken from us. That's not in your report, which I find upsetting. Um, and although we're not in the report, um, the federal government have announced an, um, an action plan to address family violence and domestic violence within our communities without no data. Mm. And that's very telling. It's um, state-sanctioned violence. Veronica, I, we've got a number of questions that yeah. take us to all of those points, so I hope to, to flesh them out as the evening goes on. And I will come back to you for a response in a moment, if I can, Anne. But, uh, Aman, let me come to you and, and, and our questioner about women leaving, because we may get to your personal story a little bit later in the mm. program. Mm. But how would you respond to Marty? I think uh, the way um, Minister Ali uh, responded in Anne, terms of... please call me Anne. Anne. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, ..responded in terms of what happens to these women when they leave. That's been a, um, uh, a key component that's been missing because we always talk about uh, family and domestic violence and the different fronts that is being fought on. Mm. And I think now with the draft um, national plan being released, we've got four pillars that have been identified and that's essentially prevention, the early intervention, uh, the, uh, the, the crisis uh, uh, end, but also the recovery, the post-crisis. Now that's been missing uh, from that conversation for a long time. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, saw, we saw that gap about seven years ago and that's why we went along in South Australia and established a, a foundation that actually addresses that gap mm -hmm. and tries to uh, assist women uh, in order to carve a, a brand new path for themselves, a path that's free of violence and abuse. And there are questions tonight that take us to the issue of post-crisis and the fact that we've perhaps front-end loaded the issue with uh, warnings and exhortations for women to leave but not provided them with the support to actually get out. Mm -hmm. Jess Hill, this question really is fundamental to the book that you wrote. Yeah, Marty, thanks so much for the question. And when I was writing the book, it was so interesting how ingrained it was in me to foreground the victim that I had to switch around the chapters to put the perpetrators right up front and that felt very um, unnatural. Uh, and a lot of my learning, and this comes particularly from victim survivors themselves, 
over the over the time has been to try to put the perpetrator back at the front of the sentence, you know, that we're talking like it's just good English to put the subject of the sentence at the beginning rather, you know, so um, and of course, when we're talking in this kind of heterosexual framework, which is sort of where we're talking tonight because we're thinking about single mothers, you know, we talk a lot about women's safety. We have a women's safety summit. Um, we have a plan for women's safety. We don't have a plan for men's violence. Mm. And it's, you know, when you don't have that lens on the actions of perpetrators, all you see is the resulting choices and the resulting behaviours, um, but it doesn't come back to what drove those behaviours. Those behaviours aren't operating in a vacuum. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it's difficult, the thing around, you know, why should women leave? I mean, a part of one of the big awakenings I had when I finally got over all my own stereotypes was, I just came to think, how on earth does she leave? And why, if he treats her so badly and seems to despise her, why doesn't he let her leave? Mm. Because actually this, when especially in, in, um, in terms of coercive control, but in most family violence, it's not just abuse, it's entrapment, mm -hmm. you know? And, and as Anne says, like, the act of leaving is utterly terrifying. And the women who leave often are, it's a high stakes operation that takes planning and preparation because he will not let her leave and he may kill her for leaving. Let me get to some other questions, but Anne, I'll just give you a moment just to briefly respond if you, if you can to Veronica's criticisms. Well, well I mean, I, I have no, no argument with Veronica. The problem uh, with, with the uh, collection of the statistics that we use, the personal safety survey, which is the federal government's uh, survey every four years of, of violence uh, and safety in Australia, and which includes domestic violence, does not include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at all. Why? Why, why is that? Well, the reason they give is they say it's, it's, it's a sampling problem. They can't get to remote communities. It's a household survey. Um, this is their argument. I can't, I'm not defending it. I'm just <laughs> saying that's what, they, what, what the situation is. Uh, similarly with LGBT. So, so, I, I so don't believe that. It's because we don't matter. Our lives don't matter. That They don't give a shit about Aboriginal people. Um, they don't give a shit about Aboriginal victims. And I'm not bringing gender into it either, like you want to, Jess. It's not about men or women. And women come in all forms, OK? You know? But um, they don't, I, they don't I, care so about Aboriginal I, I, I did... Well, I'm, I made the point that that was a criticism. I criticised yeah. that point in, in, in what I wrote. Similarly with um, LGBTQ people uh, who are included in the latest study, mm. uh, have been included in previous studies. So the study itself is evolving. Uh, this idea for having a separate plan for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is... I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I agree with that. I think I'm interested in what you think of that, whether or not that they should be integrated into the national survey I think is is the way to go. I think let's, we can do we can do our own survey actually, um, and we can look after our own problems. 